My name is James Sutton. I am an associate professor of English at FIU, and I currently have the distinct pleasure of serving as the department chairperson. I want to thank all of you for coming out to join us this afternoon. It's wonderful to be here with so many wonderful supporters and friends of FIU, our College of Arts and Sciences, and our Department of English. I wish to recognize uh, the following special guests who are with us this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg, who you will be hearing from very shortly. Mr. Alberto Carballo, uh, the superintendent of Miami-Dade County Public Schools. Dr. Rosalind Artis, the president of Florida Memorial University. Dr. Michael Heikhaus, the interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Ms. Isabel Anderson, the Vice President for the Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU. Ms. Esther Moreno, a member of the FIU Foundation Board and the English Alumni Board. Mr. David Lawrence, President of the Early Childhood Initiative Foundation. And Ms. Christine Rock, the Director of the Coral Gables Museum, who you will also be hearing from later this afternoon. This afternoon you've been invited here to help us celebrate and consider the meaning of the exhibit now on display in the Fuel Gallery of this museum, Beyond Swastika and Jim Crow. The exhibit, which was curated and managed by the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York City and now makes its last appearance here in Coral Gables before it will be, if you will, put to bed, shines a bright light on an important but largely obscured moment in 20th century American history, the flight of 50-some Jewish scholars from Nazi Germany to the United States where they were able to find teaching positions only in the historically black colleges and universities of the Jim Crow South. The exhibit considers their contributions to the education and lives of their African American students, many of whom went on to positions of prominence in the academy, in business, and in political life throughout the US. This exhibit tells a story of triumph, of two groups of people working together to overcome ideological oppression and human smallness of mind. This is a narrative that demonstrates how intellectual reciprocity and true hospitality, real generosity of mind and spirit, can transcend the worst kinds of human tyranny and oppression. This afternoon we wish to reflect on these ideas and celebrate this exhibit. And in order to do so, we have asked three pillars of education here in Miami to speak briefly about their institutions and how their schools, representing education K through 16 or 20 or 24, share some role in continuing the legacy explored in Beyond Swastika and Jim Crow. It's now my great pleasure to call up the first of our speakers, the president of Florida International University, the first FIU faculty member to ascend to the university's presidency. Mark B. Rosenberg has over 35 years of experience in higher education leadership. He was one of the principal architects of FIU's growth and expansion during the past decade. He has served as the chancellor of the state university system, and he is the author, editor, and co-editor of seven books and numerous scholarly articles on Latin America. Ladies and gentlemen, the fifth president of FIU, Dr. Mark B. Rosenberg.
I am life for our minds. So I, I want to thank my colleagues uh, for performing. I'm going to ask, ask you to do a couple things this afternoon. One is to uh, preside over part of this conversation about the honest loss there. And um, also to, to spend a few moments on what we're doing in areas that relate to humanities and the non-STEM side of our higher education discourse. And, and the best thing I can say about that is that, that our colleagues in this, in, in, in FIU, beginning with Dr. Sutton, Dr. Gillespie, and so many others are passionately committed to ensuring that the humanities and the cultural arts don't be put on the back burner. And we aggressively support that at the university because we understand that our responsibility at FIU is not just to prepare people for, to, to make a living, but to prepare whoever chooses to spend time with us to make a good life. We understand that the kinds of reflections and critical analysis and self, uh, and self, uh, if you will, absorption that derive from exhibitions such as uh, the Beyond Swastika and Jim Crow are absolutely critical in both uh, us helping to understand our identity and our identification. I'm not sure, but I suppose it's because of that that I was asked in part to reflect on personal experience that I have had with the issue of the Holocaust. Because the picture you see to, to my right and to your left is my mother. And uh, if you look closely, you will see on her left arm five numbers, 52436. So what I thought I would do was uh, reflect on that with you. I had the opportunity to, to look at the to look at the at our at our um, at our exhibition this afternoon, not as long as I wanted to, but I was struck by the fact that there is a uh, a statement in there, a caption in there, uh, as a consequence of a circumstance in Birmingham in 1942. And several uh, of the refugee professors were fined for having lunch at an African American cafeteria. And uh, one of them reflects that this is the best of America and it's the worst of America. And during that period of time, the 1940s, truthfully, it was, it was very easy to allow for dichotomies the dichotomies of black, white, bad, good, slavery, freedom. Uh, to, to drive how people in this country and elsewhere define how they would live. But the truth be told, life is, is far more complex. Life is far more complex than simply the black body. And I think that's in many reasons why we're very interested in this, in, 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 in the lessons that we can take away from Beyond Swastika and Jim Crow. So what's in, a, what's in a number? Five. The, that was the number of, uh, of, of uh, members of my mother's family. Her mother, her mother, her father, uh, two, uh, my, my mother, Laura, her sister, and her brother. My mother's the only one who survived. Two. I asked my, my younger sister a couple of days ago to, what is, is there anything that our mother ever said to us about this experience that, that could enable us to understand this number two? She said, my, my, my sister immediately responded yes. She said, you remember mom used to talk about uh, her experience at Auschwitz and that when the transports would come in, and you've all seen the pictures of the, of the unloading uh, at Birkenau of, of, of the uh, train transports, that she was struck, that my mother was struck by the fact that when people got off of the transport, they would pinch their cheeks as hard as they possibly could, two cheeks. And the reason that they would do that is because they knew there was going to be a selection. And they knew 
that if they did not look healthy, they would not survive that selection. They would be ushered off to one side, right in to those gas chambers. Four, the, the, the fact that uh, Laura, who survived subsequently uh, with uh, her husband, my father, our father, had four children. And uh, each of us are blessed to still have our health and uh, to survive our parents, which was very important in particular for my father, who was an only child, and himself as first generation in the United States, the son of immigrants from Russia who came through Ellis Island. Now the irony is that my father was an army captain, came through Normandy, around D-Day, and isn't it interesting that as we study uh, the, the, the paradox of, of segregation, that my father, a Jewish army captain, was the company commander of all black troops in a segregated company. There were only two other white uh, uh, individuals in that company, both of them themselves lieutenants. And uh, to this day, to this day, it's puzzling to me how that experience had an impact uh, throughout the, the post-war years uh, on, on, on each of the four siblings. Uh, and I think it's in part because of that that, that it, each of us, uh, starting with me, feel a, a very strong um, concern about exclusion, about separation. And, um, but, but, but even here, it was those troops with my father who liberated my mother, essentially from Auschwitz. And uh, so you see, in many ways, it is shades of gray. It's not. It's not uh, black and white. Three of the number of uh, cousins that my mother uh, that survived, along with my mother. Uh, fortunately, the three of them are still alive in Israel, and periodically I get to see them and I get to talk to them. And um, it's just unbelievable to have those conversations about an era that doesn't seem like it could have it could have ever happened. Yet we're we're talking about it. Uh, today. And six is 46, the year that uh, my mother fortunately uh, came to the United States through Ellis Island herself as a consequence of my father's efforts once he uh, returned in, 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 in early 1946 to, to retrieve her out of the displaced persons camp and get her uh, to, this, to this country. The best of America, the worst of America. The, 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 the dichotomies of a, of, a, of a dreadful war situation, and yet the incredible shades of gray and nuances, even in that mix, that uh, teach us something about uh, human relations and, and humanity. So I, I'm really, really uh, pleased that, that, that FIU can be a part of, of this gathering. I'm really looking forward to the conversation uh, that we're going to have here. Uh, uh, Jewish refugee scholars uh, were so important in the evolution of this country in so many ways. And, 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 and here's just another way, perhaps really a hidden chapter, that absolutely needs to be celebrated as we are doing on this Sunday uh, here in, in Coral Gables. So uh, I want to thank you all uh, for being here. I'm really pleased to introduce to you uh, Dr. Rosalind Clark Artis. Florida Memorial University. Dr. Artis was recently inaugurated as FMU's 13th president. She's the first woman to serve uh, as president in the university's really incredible 135 year history. And in just a few months as president, Dr. Artis has already put forth a vision that preparing FMU, uh, Florida Memorial students for the challenges that, 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 that we're all going to face in the 21st century. So please join me in welcoming our new president at Florida Memorial University, Rosalind Clark Hart.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg and the entire Florida International University family. I am certainly pleased to have the opportunity to share this momentous exhibit with our community uh, and certainly to many of the guests that are here today. Our Board of Trustees members from Florida and Lauren who have taken time out of their schedules to join us, I thank you. And staff and faculty, and most importantly, students of Florida Memorial, thank you for being with us today. We listened to the beautiful spring quartet uh, just a moment ago, and we're so pleased and impressed with the myriad of talents demonstrated by our students. At Florida Memorial University, we have a deep and abiding music tradition as well. Many of you may know at Florida Memorial, the Negro National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, <coughs> by James Weldon Johnson and his brother Jay Rosamond Johnson. We are indeed the home of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Among those lyrics, the words, we have come over a way that with tears has been water. We have come treading a path through the blood of the slaughter. Sadly, that is a shared experience between African Americans and their Jewish brethren. I recently had the opportunity to travel to Israel and to visit Yad Vashem and to see the tragedy and travesty of Nazi Germany played out in a beautiful and compelling way designed to help us to never, ever forget. Those who forget their histories are doomed to repeat them. I am speaking about the exhibit with a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Tamika Hobbs, who's here with us today with our students. She had occasion to share a poem with me, and I would like to share just a small snippet of that poem with you. It was written by Langston Hughes, and it chronicles the symmetries between the African American experience in America and our Jewish brethren. You tell me that Hitler is a mighty bad man. I guess he took lessons from the Ku Klux Klan. You tell me Mussolini's got an evil heart. Well, it must have been in Beaumont that he got his start. Because everything that Hitler and Mussolini do, Negroes get the same treatment from you. Yet you say we're fighting for democracy. Then why don't democracy include me? I ask you this question because I want to know how long I got to fight both Hitler and Jim Crow. I do not yet know the answer to that question. I suppose we fight until the battle is won. Many know that the battles continue across our country and in fact across the world. The battle rages on in our communities, in our homes, in our cities. However, today our focus is not on the battle. Rather, our focus is on the shared experiences with our Jewish scholars and our nation's historically black colleges and universities. It is not about the negative. It is not about the sad. It is not about the travesty. Rather, this exhibit chronicles the lives and the histories of these scholars and our nation's HBCUs. I am honored to walk along with you to journey in the path and to celebrate the history of perseverance and the true spirit we shall overcome. I am so pleased to be a part of this day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. And now I'm pleased to introduce to you our superintendent of schools, Alberto Carvalho. Uh, since becoming superintendent in 2008, he, together with his incredible team and a lot of dedicated teachers and professional staff, have transformed our public school system. Transformed it to the point now that it's recognized as a national model. Transformed it now to the point that they're graduating uh, nearly 20,000 students every year, uh, each of whom as a better education as a consequence of the presence of, of the superintendent, his team, and, and, and his incredible school board. Uh, Mr. Carvalho has been a wonderful partner for us at FIU. We have a, a range of initiatives that we, that we only could have dreamed about uh, prior to his uh, laser-like focus 
on student achievement as a superintendent. So I'm very pleased to welcome our superintendent of schools, Alberto Carvalho. Thank you very much uh, for that very kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll be extremely brief. Number one, I feel terribly humbled and, and proud, honored uh, to be part of this conversation. And uh, not just to be part of this conversation, but to be in a company of individuals that not only believe in history, but believe in living history. Uh, the value of history does not necessarily reside simply in books. The value of history resides in the power it has to influence and to shape the mentality, particularly of youth. Uh, it was said before me that history, and part of its importance, is not only to recognize accomplishment, but also to avoid peril. It's not only to understand triumph out of tragedy, but to avoid its repetition, particularly as lived by those who are still being educated in our schools and our universities. I'm also struck by the fact that sometimes Invisible threats make the strongest ties. And this invisible threat that exists between uh, certainly those fleeing persecution, uh, terrible oppression, devastation, and maniacal genocide found a home uh, with those who were themselves oppressed and persecuted. It is said that it takes one to recognize one, it takes one to understand one, and sometimes parallel journeys lead, in fact, to better places. There is symmetry in the histories uh, that we will learn and are learning through this wonderful exhibit. But the exhibit, once again, like a book, if not read, internalized, and lived, it did not fulfill, perhaps, the author's intent. And if you do what I do, intent leads to practice. And we believe in, in fact, walking the walk. Therefore, just last Friday, our teachers collaborated alongside professors and entities from this museum in developing the curriculum that follows and is attached to this exhibit. And over 200 to 300 students out of five schools will have the opportunity for free not only to travel through this exhibit, but in fact to unleash living history. I am blessed today, I wasn't expecting it, I, I thought I knew a lot about Dr. Rosenberg, and in fact we do have a terrific partnership, as we have a terrific partnership with Florida Memorial University. And I have to say that these two entities, just within the past 12 months, uh, gave me an honorary doctoral degree, which I will forever treasure. Not because of what I do, but because of what uh, terribly, terrifically inspired and inspirational teachers do every single day in my own day. So I thought I knew a lot about Dr. Rosenberg. I knew his mother was a survivor. But having it told the way he just told it to us brought history alive in a very meaningful way. And when I talk about invisible threats uh, being the strongest of ties, just listen to me for a second. Just before I came to this exhibit, I felt I needed a little bit of caffeine. So I went over to Books and Books. And there is a gentleman still there right now reading a book and author, Martin Amos, who uh, is reading a book dealing with the Holocaust and how a survivor fell in love in Auschwitz. Uh, I speak with, with Mitch, the owner of Books and Books, he says, how coincidental, I had no idea that the event they're gonna be at is taking place right next door. I need to go to the exhibit. Now I came here and I hear from Dr. Rosenberg, his point in storage. Just last week, I was with Samuel, the last living survivor of Treblinka at the Guzman Center, telling a story that is so similar yet so different. As I said, invisible threads are the strongest ties. And what connects us all, particularly these wonderful educators, as Dr. Rosenberg said, did so much for the America we are today. Aided and comforted and supported by those who were themselves persecuted 
those labor in historically black colleges and universities, those invisible threats have made certainty for the strongest of times. And I, for having listened, and our teachers, teachers and students, for having now the ability and the opportunity not only to listen, but to actually learn. And not even just learn, but to put these thoughts, ideas, ideals into practical terms in living better lives is the significance of this exhibit. Jan Swastika and Jim Crow for better. Thank you very much, and I am ever so pleased to be a partner of this terrific endeavor. Thank you. 
with whom I've worked very closely for more than 18 months to make this exhibit a reality. Dr. Asher Milmauer is a professor of 19th and 20th century literature, <coughs> the director of our graduate program in literature, and the director as well of our Exile Studies Certificate Program. Dr. Michael Gillespie is a professor of 20th century British modernism and a specialist in particular in James Joyce. He also directs the Center for the Humanities in an Urban Environment at FIU. Dr. Milbauer and Dr. Gillespie, can both of you come forward and uh, make some further remarks, please, upon the exhibit in your work. Dr. Milbauer. As the final 
speaker and the director of the Center for the Humanities in an Urban Environment, I've been tasked with talking to you about the humanities in two minutes or less. <laughs> Given the exhibition that is here, the marvelous speakers that have preceded me, and the audience that I'm addressing right now, that's a very easy task. Beyond Swastika and Jim Crow, although a profoundly historical exhibit, touching on tragedies both on the European continent and in the American continent, underscores the profound sense of humanity that moves us all and allows us to give meaning to our lives in even the most trying times. The speakers who preceded me have presented marvelous insights on the diverse ways that humanities touch us and move us in a profound way and direct us to, towards being better human beings. And finally, you as an audience are representative of the best in Miami. My wife and I came here five years ago from Milwaukee, knowing very little about Miami and not knowing at all what to expect. Miami is a sophisticated, energetic, engaged community that has a very profound regard and a very deep sense of the humanities. It's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to work in the humanities, in this community. And it's a great privilege to have the opportunity to, to, to tell you, as representatives of Miami, thank you. Thank you for all you do for the humanities. Thank you all. That does conclude our program in, in this room. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg, Dr. Artis, Mr. Carvalho, Ms. Rock, my two very dear colleagues, Dr. Bilbauer and Dr. Gillespie, for your remarks today. Thank you all for being here. We'll continue now with a reception outside in the courtyard. Uh, you walk through the hallway, turn right, and just and you'll, you'll see where everyone goes. Um, and I believe there's, the bar will still be open in the back. Um, and as Dr. Rosenberg has said several times already, we, we view this as the beginning of a conversation um, that you may have with, with each other uh, about this exhibit and about the issues that it presents so clearly and so forcefully. Thank you all very much for being here, uh, and do also please keep in mind that beyond today, the exhibit remains here at the Coral Gables Museum through early January. We invite you all back, bring your school children. I plan to bring my uh, fifth grader, and fourth grader, my fourth grader and my seventh grader many times to see this exhibit. Um, bring your friends, bring your family, Let's make sure that everyone in Miami knows about this before it leaves on January 11th. Thank you so much. <laughs>